No, okay, so this week's parsha is parashat is parashat Akiv. and in this week's parsha we have uh, an interesting description of Eretz Yisrael. If you look at the beginning of the parsha, we will notice that in the four psukim that you have in your sheets in front of you, hopefully uh, you can see them. You can see that in these four psukim. The Torah describes to us the uniqueness of the land of Israel. I'm going to read it together now. And I would like people to notice how many times the word lands, Eretz, appears here. so it is true that the word Eretz appears um, six times and Eretz the seventh. But the word Eretz, the word land, appears in this paragraph seven times, which we all know when we have a word, a milah mancha, that appears seven times in a paragraph, we all um, agree, I hope, that this is a not just a coincidence, but rather a motif of this paragraph, which wants to emphasize something special about Eretz. Now, let's, let's go back a second to Sefer Dvarim. Sefer Dvarim is Moshe Rabbeinu standing before the Jewish people as they are about to go into the land of Israel. And he's de delivering a sermon about what's waiting for them as they go into the land of Israel. So it makes sense that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to describe the, the qualities of the land of Israel. Okay, so what are the qualities? What's so special about the land of Israel? Let's try to go back a second to, um, to oh, I'm sorry, not that one. I'm sorry, let me just, uh, sorry, not that one. Um, let me go back. I'm sorry, one second. Rabbi, could you mute everyone? There are people still talking. Oh, um, I will try. Okay, I will try. One second. Okay. I will you. try to. I'm just because I know no one's no one uh, is here helping me today. That's why I'm going to try mute everyone. How do you do that? How do you mute everyone? And the participants. Uh, yeah. And the participant, thank you. Uh, and the participants. Oh, there it is. I'm trying to. It's just because I'm opening on share, so I don't have all the information in front of me. I'll try to do it soon when I when I soon close this. I hope I apologize. Um, let's let's go back to the qualities. What is Eretz Israel so special about? So in the beginning, the Torah describes us that the uniqueness of the land of Israel is its source of water. And what is the source of water in Pasuk Zain? God, it says, is bringing you to Eretz Tova, a good land, a land of Nachalei Maim. Nachal is rivers. Ayanot, what's an ayin? Ayin is a ma'ayan, is what we call a spring. By the way, in Israel today, like if you know, uh, ain't surim, ain't prat. Ain is another word for ma'ayan. It's not, a, it's not a really an ay, right? It's part of the word of the ma'ayan, maybe a similar word to the word ayin. So ayanot is ma'ayanot, springs. Yotzim babika uvahar. I'm sure that people are aware that in Israel, in the hills, specifically in the hills, but in the valleys of the hills, right? Babika uvahar, we have sources of water, spring water. I live in the Gush area, and in the Gush area, we have lots of mayanot outside Yerushalayim. There are lots of mayanot, a lot of springs, rainwater that goes through the mountains and does not penetrate the mountain to the bottom, somehow comes out. The famous mayana gichon in Yerushalayim, of course. Uh, the Shiloach is a Ma'ayan. The spring, uh, springs are very common source of water in Eretz Israel. But notice, please, what's not written here. What is not mentioned here? What source of water is not mentioned here? Rain. Rain does not appear here. Now, we know that in Israel, rain is a very important thing, and yet it's not mentioned here. What we do mention here is Nachale Mayim, rivers. It's, we don't have many rivers in Israel, but we do have some rivers, especially all the rivers that go 
from you know we have the rivers from your from your shaline that go down to the dead sea dead sea up up in the up in the Golan and the Galil, we have rivers. The Jordan River is a, is a river. So the source of water is rivers and springs. But notice that what's missing here is rain. And that's a very big question. Why is rain missing here? Let's continue. What else is Israel special about? Pasuk Chet, a very famous Pasuk. Eretz chita u seora, vegefen u teena virimon, Eretz zeichemen udvash. Eretz Israel is special because it is a land that has. Um, the famous Shivat Aminim, the famous species of the land of Israel, and Israel is special, pomegranates, olives, Te'ina, Virimon, Chita, Seora, these are all uh, the special fruit that even till today are the symbol of Eretz Israel. By the way, I'll just mention that Gefen, Te'ina, Virimon, if you recall, are the three fruit that the Miraglim, the spies of Israel, brought back to Eretz to the to to B'nai Israel and show them the unique fruit of Eretz Israel. They brought them to show how weird and strange the land of Israel is. While the Torah here is as it's playing with us and telling us, no, these fruits are actually the the beauty of Eretz Israel. They're the, what makes Eretz Israel special and unique. And sometimes you can look at the same fruit from different perspectives. You can use them to speak ill and bad, negative about Israel, or in this case to speak positive. But again, the fruit of Israel are what, what are unique, what grows in the ground, okay, are unique. Let's go on. What else is Israel special about? Eretz, Pasuk Tet, Asher lo bibisnu tochal belechem, you'll be able to, you'll be able to make bread, lo tekhsar koba, it has wonderful fruit, vegetables like we just mentioned, but listen to this, Eretz, Asher avanea barzel, umehararea tachtov nechoshet. Eretz Israel has a lot of source of mines of what we say a quarry that you can you can take out rocks and 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 minerals even from the land. Nechoshet is copper. We have copper mines apparently in Israel. Um, those of you might know that down south in Timna near Elat, there actually are mines that used to be used today. They don't really use them anymore. But according to the Tanakh, there are mines in Israel that you can mine the land, the ground, and take out minerals out of the water. By the way, uh, Yama Melach till today is one of the most important sources of minerals. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's, I think it's Israel's number one export till today, the minerals that we take out by Yama Melach. So the Torah is describing the, the, the uniqueness of the land of Israel in its source of water, in its fruit that it produces, and its... Um, it's the natural reserves that we have. Unfortunately, the Torah doesn't mention here oil, right? Uh, that we don't have, but we have other uh, um, we have other minerals in in the ground. And to sum it up, the Torah says, "You should thank God for the land that He gives you." So this is what Israel is special about. However, as I mentioned, what's really mess what's really missing here is rain. Not mentioned here, and I say that because in this week's parsha, we have the famous parsha of Vayayim Shamoa, the parsha that we say three times a day. Um, we in Shachris and Marv, before we go to sleep, we say it at least twice a day. Um, and we mention in the famous parsha of Vayayim Shamoa that rain is, is the, 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 the way for us in Israel to recognize whether or not Josh Baruch Hu is uh, protecting us is uh, watching over us. And it's very strange that it doesn't appear here. Let's leave that question open and let's now go to the end of this week's parsha. In the Shishi of this week's parsha, a little bit before Shishi, in Dvar Yud Al Pasuk Chet, we have another paragraph and lo and behold, we have another description about the land of Israel. In the same parsha, it appears again. Why? Is the Torah describing us the land of Israel again? We already talked about it. So the answer, of course, will be that if you notice carefully what is being described here, you will see a total different description of the, 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 the qualities of the land of Israel. Let's go and read the Pesukim. Dvarim Perikut Aleph, Pasuk Chet, Ushmartem et Kola Mitzvah, Asheranochim Mitzavcha, Hayom. And by the way, here again, I, I ask people to try to follow how many times does the word Eretz appear here? 
I'll, 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 I'll ruin it for you. I'm sorry, but it's also seven. Okay, so again, here, the word Eretz will appear seven times, which again will mean that this is a paragraph which is focused on the land of Israel and its uniqueness. Let's, let's, You shall inherit the land that you come to. You will, your days will lengthen if you, that God gave you. Again, Eretz, Zavat, Chalav, Udvash. What is Eretz Israel special? It's the land of milk and honey. Above, it was the land of Eretz, Chitao, Sarao, Gevin, Viteina. Here, it's just the land of milk and honey. What else is it special? Kiaaretz that you were coming to. It's not like, look, Eretz Mitzrayim. It's not like Egypt. Asher Tizrai, Zaracha, Vishkita, Beraglecha, Tigan, Hayara. The Torah tells us that in Egypt, you use your legs to water your 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 um, fields while in Eretz Israel you're not going to use your raglaim but rather how will you find water we, we saw that before it's a land of hills and valleys but unlike before where we focused on rivers and springs here we're focused on here the focus is on rain. And here we can explain that the source of water is rain, unlike in Egypt, where it's beraglecha. Why the beraglecha? So the, the, the what is the source of water in, in, in Egypt? The Nile. And you they used to take from the Nile beraglaim. They used to carry, right? They used to fill the buckets with water and carry the buckets over to their fields. Some people like to explain beraglecha means that you can, with your foot, open up the dam that stops the water from entering from the main river, the Nile River, into your own plot of land. So you didn't even have to pick up any, any uh, uh, buckets because the water would go from the Nile into small tunnels into each people's fields, so you would be able to Net to to be here to you know to to play with the water by just opening and closing the dams with your foot. That's a nice shot. But the idea really is to compare between the the Nile of Egypt to rainwater in Israel. And lastly, the Torah tells us, Eretz Asher Hashem Elokecha Doresh Otatami. What's again special about Eretz Israel? That God Doresh Otatami. God is consistently watching over the land of Israel, supervising. Um, he's always aware of what's going on in the land of Israel. We would call in Hebrew, hashgacha pratit. Hashem is mashgiach, Hashem is watching. Now, here we have a totally different description of the land of Israel from which we had before. So what do we have here? We have two paragraphs that talk about Israel. One focuses on the fact that we have beautiful fruit that come out of it, that we have beautiful water sources like rivers and springs. And we also have beautiful sources, natural sources, resources in the ground like copper. However, the other paragraph talks about the rain and about the fact that God watches over the land of Israel. Why are there two descriptions and why are they so different? Um, the answer, of course, is a very simple answer, but it is a profound one, which I want to focus on. The answer is, is that when you want to sell someone something, it's not just about what you're selling them, but it's what they're comparing what they have in front of them to. Meaning, if a person has, you know, um, um, a car that you're trying to, you're trying to sell them a car, so if you're trying for, if until now we had a motorcycle and you're trying to sell him a car, then you're going to talk about the differences and the uniqueness of a car, unlike a motorcycle. So you're going to focus on in what way is a car different than a motorcycle. But if this person has a, and let's say a, um, he has in a, 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 a gas car based on gas and you want to sell him a car that's going to work on electricity, so your whole description of what your car is is going to be totally different. You're not going to talk about the fact 
that it's safer, for example. I mean, maybe it is, but right, you'll talk about that, that it saves you money. Um, you're not going to say that if you compare it to a motorcycle because it's more expensive than having a motorcycle, right? So your description of whatever you're trying to sell is dependent upon what you're trying to compare this product to. In the first paragraph, it's very, very clear that Moshe Rabbeinu is comparing the land of Israel to the desert. While in the second paragraph, it explicitly tells us that he's comparing it to Eretz Mitzrayim. And think about it right now. If you're right now one of the Israelites who's sitting in the, in the desert, the only two experiences that you've had until now in your life were Egypt and the desert. Those are the two models of geographical areas which you have experience from. And when Moshe Rabbeinu is talking about the land of Israel, he is trying to compare the qualities of the land of Israel based upon the two um, experiences that the Jews or the Israelites had until now. Let's now go back to the paragraphs and prove that this is exactly what's happening. In paragraph one, Moshe Rabbeinu is comparing the desert to Eretz Israel, unlike the desert which has no resources. The, the, the desert has sand. There is no copper or minerals in the desert. But let's talk more about that. What is the source of water in, in the desert? There is no uh, uh, really source. There's no water really in the desert. But what is there? Um, in Bnei Israel had water from his birth. He had some kind of miracles. But in Eretz Israel, he can talk about Eretz Nachalei Mayim. Now, I, I would argue it's not so much that he's comparing the water to the Midbar that he is not mentioning, he's not mentioning a river when he talks in the next paragraph. In the next paragraph, when he talks about Egypt, you can't tell people that there's a river in Israel, unlike Egypt. That would be foolish because in, in, in Egypt, we have the best river. We have the Nile. So to tell people, oh, in Egypt, in Israel, we have the river Nile. While in Egypt, I'm sorry, we have the river Jordan. While in Egypt, we had um, the Nile. That's ridiculous. That makes it sound as if Israel is not as good as Egypt is. You know, there's a, uh, I once read that what, that the, the Zionist kind of in, in the in the 1980s there were there were when people used to describe Israel to European Jews that were never in Israel they talked about the Jordan River and they described this rushing river and I once read a a, um, a uh, testimony of some um, Zionist who made Aliyah and he was ready to see you know he came from Russia and the rivers of Russia are these huge rivers and he comes to the Jordan River and he's suddenly shocked to see uh, the river uh, that's such a, a small little trickle of water, the Jordan River, right? So it'd be foolish if we would compare the rivers of Israel to the rivers of Jordan. So there's no purpose in the second paragraph of, of, the, of Egypt. There's no purpose, there's no reason to, to talk about river water. So we'll talk about spring water. What else do we have in, in, in Israel that we don't have in the desert? Chita, Seora, Gefen, Teina. Nothing grows in the desert. There's nothing is dead. The desert, you can't grow anything. In Israel, however, we can grow things. And, and by the way, I think it's interesting because we all know that Israel is also stationed on the border of a desert. And yet we can grow things in Israel unlike the desert. And, and, and lastly, we said, as we mentioned, unlike the desert, which is only has sand and no resources, Israel has resources. However, when we go to Dvarim Perakut Aleph, and we talk about uh, the uniqueness of the land of Israel when it comes to comparing it to Egypt, here the main focus is rain. As we know, in Egypt, there's no rain. There's only the Nile. So here, uh, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu mentions in Pasuk Yud, you left Egypt, there the water is really from the Nile. However, in Israel, you drink rain from the rain, from the, from the water from heaven. Now, if we would stop here, I would ask you a very simple question. I wish we had a classroom right now, which I can see everybody, because I think we would get very interesting responses right now. Stop a second and think, is that actually a good thing? Is it good uh, is, is Moshe Rabbeinu trying to sell the positive side of Israel and argue that it's better to have rainwater than it, have, than it is to have a Nile? 
it would seem that having a Nile is better because it assures you a 24 seven resource of water. While we know that rainwater always carries with it the danger of having a drought. So why is that really something that Moshe Rabbeinu is emphasizing as if it's a positive thing? I'll leave that question open, but I'll, but, but I'll continue to the next pasuk, which now I think we really understand. In this paragraph, Moshe Rabbeinu mentions that the uniqueness of the land of Israel is Hashem doresh ota tamid. God is always watching over Israel. Now notice that he doesn't mention that in the first paragraph. Why not? That would be foolish to mention that compared to the desert. Why? Because B'nai Israel in the desert were watched consistently by Abdush Baruch 24-7, God was present in the desert, giving them manna from the sky, giving them um, tents, you know, air-conditioned tents, giving them the Anana Kavod, um, water, food, everything was about the feeling the presence of God. So for Moshe Rabbeinu to say that Israel is better because there you feel the presence of God wouldn't be correct. So that this pasuk is omitted from the first paragraph. But when we compare the land of Israel to, 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 to Mitzrayim, there we understand that what's unique about Israel is Doresh Ota Tamid. God's eyes are ba. God is staring as if at Israel. Now, you know, I just want to mention that my Abba, Allah Shalom, had a great shot on this pasuk. My father used to say that, what does it mean, God is staring at it? My father used to say that when someone looks at something straight ahead, you can still see from the side of your eye what's going on, Right? You, can, uh, it's, you can't see as well, but you can see from the side. My father explained the pshat. Hashem God looks at Eretz Yisrael directly. From the side of his eye, he controls the world. But his eye focus is Eretz Yisrael. It's a nice, I think it's a nice pshat if you want to accept it. But anyway, here it makes sense why Moshe Rabbeinu is trying to emphasize the uniqueness of Eretz Yisrael is the fact that God is mashgiach over Eretz Yisrael. So here we have, so here we have two different models of uniqueness of Eretz Yisrael. And as I said, it's all about what we are comparing it to. But I would like to continue a little bit and talk about, talk a little bit more specifically about Israel being the opposite of Egypt. This idea that Israel is different than Egypt is not, is not the first time uh, that we meet, the first time that we meet this is not in Sefer Devarim. The idea that Eretz Mitzrayim is not only different than, Mitz, than Eretz Yisrael, but might even be the exact opposite of Eretz Yisrael is a profound idea, I think, within the Tanakh. I would even argue that the, the arch enemy, as if, of the land of Israel is Mitzrayim. Bad, right? Or in other words, in the times of the Tanakh, the, the opposite of what Israel stood for was Mitzrayim. And I'll explain. This goes back, and I have it on your sheet. I can also put it back on, but we have it on your sheet. This might go back to Sefer Bereshit. Sefer Bereshit is, there are a lot of stories that are happening, but I think we can, we can maybe agree that there is one story that's happening throughout Sefer Bereshit. And that is a story of how Bnei Israel end up in Egypt. If you think about it, Avram goes down to Egypt. Remember that? When there was a famine? Yitzchak, when there's a famine, also wants to go down to Egypt. God says no. Yaakov, when there's a famine, where does he want to go? And where does he go? He goes to Egypt. The sons of Yaakov, when there's a famine, where do they go? They go down to Egypt. Now, Egypt here, is exactly the opposite of what God is saying to Avram. Lech lecha, go to the land of Israel. And where does Avram end up going? He go, ends up going to Egypt. Where does Yaakov end up going? He goes down to Egypt. Sefer Bereshit ends with the, Jew, with the Bnei Israel staying in Egypt. While they were told in the beginning, right, the first time we ever heard of the Israeli family, the Jewish family, whatever you want to call it, is Avram being told, go to the land of Israel. Lech lecha That's the first time that we know anything about 
Avram Avinu and Yitzchak and Yaakov go to the land of Israel. And yet, how does the Chumash end? The Chumash ends with Bnei Israel going to Mitzrayim. Let's go back a second. When Avram comes back to Eretz Yisrael, he You're comes... Mute. Thank you. Um, when Avram comes back to, to, with, with Lot, remember he's, he's traveling back from where? From Egypt. And apparently he and Lot don't get along. They're fighting. The shepherds, their sheep, they're all fighting. They're not getting along. Avram suggests to Lot, Lot, my, my, good, my good nephew, it's time to us separate. But I, I just want to say something that is not so funny, but it is a bit ironic. Avram uses the expression there, Achim anachnu. Hello, Achim. We are brothers. I don't know if people are, are familiar that today in Israel, with all what's going on in Israel right now, every time there's a fight going on between the, about, for the Jerkil system, everyone on both sides are using this pasuk. Oh, we're brothers. Achim anachnu. But people forget sometimes that it's not used in such a positive way. It's used in Sefer Bereshit as a reason for Avram to separate for Lot. We are brothers, let's separate. So it's not, it's a bit ironic that people use it sometimes out of the context as if it means let's unite when really in the source it means let's separate. But anyway, Lot, Avram says, Lot, because, uh, because the ice I'm offering you, you can, you can, um, you can, you um, can, suggest I give you the option to decide to choose where you want to live. Where does Lot want to live? In the Jordan Valley. Let's go a second really quickly back to the Psukim here. I'm sharing the screen again. And read the Psukim. Vegam lelot haolechet Avram ayatzonu vakar pasuk vav vona sautam haaret lashevet yachdav Haaretz, remember Haaretz, the land. They can't sit together. Vayiriv pasuk zayin, vayomer pasuk chet, vayomer avram elot. Al nati miriva. Let's not have a fight. Ki ashi anashim achim anachnu. Pasuk tet. Halokol haaretz, the whole land is in front of you. Let's separate. Now listen carefully. Vayisa lot et einav. Lot carries his eyes, and what does he see? Those of you who know the geography, they're coming back from Egypt. Egypt is down south. They're coming up north. They're traveling up north. And apparently they come up to the Jordan Valley. Vayar et kol kikar hayarden. Kikar, kikar in modern Hebrew is a square. It's a flat surface. The flat surface of the Jordan is the Jordan Valley. Now what's special about the Jordan Valley? Kikula mashke. What's mashke? Mashke is, is, is a, something, a drink, right? It's, it's, it's fertile. Why is it fertile? Very simple. Because the Jordan Valley has a Jordan River in it. Even though the Jordan Valley is the, one of the hottest places in Israel, and by the way, I, I did my army service for a few good months in the Jordan Valley. I was in a tank in the Jordan Valley in July, August, and I can tell you that it's a very hot place. And and uh, um, till not long ago, if you Googled the hottest places in the world, till recent, they may have changed it. Um, the Jordan Valley received the the third highest um, um, rank of heat in the of of heat since heat was measured in the world. In the 1950s, it reached 55 Celsius. OK, uh, maybe the past week, uh, everywhere in the world has broken that. But but I'm just saying uh, um, it, it's a very hot place. And yet, and it's a desert. How do things grow? Because of the Jordan River. So Lot, when he comes back from Egypt and he sees this, he's associating this with Egypt. He's saying to himself, ah, Egypt is a, such a fertile land because of the Nile. I will choose to live in a place which has similar qualities, and that is the Jordan Valley. And by the way, the Pasuk even tells us that that was his idea. Look what it says in the Pasuk. Before God destroyed, before God destroyed Sdom, which was in the Jordan Valley, Bet Amora, it's fertile. As Gan Hashem Ke Eretz Mitzrayim. It's like Eretz Mitzrayim. You see that? The Torah here explicitly tells us that what is Lot seen is mind, Eretz Mitzrayim. That's where Lot wants to live. He wants to live in Egypt. Now, this will all explain something very, very, very simple 
if you're if you're still with me, I, I want I want you now to continue one more story, and you'll see why the next story will make a lot of sense. In the next story, I'm going to read to you. We're going to moving a bit forward in Sefer Bereshit, and there, God tells Avram that he's angry at the people of Sodom, and he is going to destroy Sodom. And Lot will be saved, right? We all know that story. The angels come to Sodom to save uh, Lot and his family. And it says in the Psukim, and I will read it to you now again. Let's read it again. Lot is sitting in the city of Sodom. And he says, guys, come, come in my house. They say, no, no, we want to stay out. He gives them drink. He brings them matzah. He gives them matzot to eat. Why is that important? I don't know, but I do know one thing. Rashi tells, you see, can you see Rashi? Umatzot afa pesachaya. Rashi, according to Rashi, Lot was serving matzah to the angels because it was a night of Pesach, which doesn't, I mean, what the heck is going on with Rashi here? We're celebrating Pesach two, a, a thousand years before Jews were even in Egypt? What, what is this idea that they're celebrating Pesach in Sdom in the days of Avram Avinu? What, what's going on here? The answer is so simple. Rashi, of course, doesn't mean that they are really keeping Pesach the way we keep Pesach. Rashi is telling us the story of Pesach is happening here. What did we say before? We were saying that Mitzrayim is basically the Jordan Valley, correct? The Jordan Valley has the, has the Jordan River. Mitzrayim has the Nile. They are both similar places. In both stories, now and later on in Sefer Shemot, God decides to take to destroy a place and take one of the, the tzaddikim out. In the story of Sdom, it's Lot and his family. In Egypt, it'll be Bnei Israel. By the way, notice that often the story of Lot, Bnei Israel go into the house, right? And in, in Mitzrayim, how are we saved? We're saved if we close the doors and, and, and God goes around killing all the Egyptians, but the house of Israelites is saved. Also Lot. Lot's family has to stay in the house, and they are those who go into the house are saved. God saves uh, uh, the families in the, in, the, in the same way. And the same way Lot is saved in Sdom, Bnei Israel will be saved later on in, 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 uh, in, in Egypt. And the same way, by the way, there's a word that appears in both places. It says that Lot's wife turned into salt, a pillar of salt, because they waited. The only time in Chumash that that verb comes up again will be in Tzat Mitzrayim. And in Tzat Mitzrayim, it says they are not allowed to wait. They had to go quickly, in haste. We know that one of the motifs of Pesach is Chipazon. We must leave quickly. The whole idea of a matzah, by the way, is something that's baked quickly. B'nai Israel had to eat it Quickly, they had to have their staff in their hands and their boots on, and they had to eat Pesach Bechipazon. Also in Lot, Lot's family had to leave Bechipazon. They had to leave really quickly. God is teaching us in both cases. When God wants to save someone, it's on his terms. When he's ready, when he tells you to leave, you must leave. Those who won't leave will be turned into salt. Those who won't leave will stay in Egypt. It's the redemption is God's will when God is ready in both stories. But the story, I think, can only be really understood once we understand that there's a parallel between the Jordan Valley and Egypt. But now it gets more interesting because what city is established in the Jordan Valley? Sdom. Till today, till today, Sdom is uh, in our minds, is the symbol of a corrupt city. Um, it is, it's, 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 a, it's a place which symbolizes um, illegal, uh, immoral actions. Um, you know, my, my, my Abba, some of you, I think some of you know, knew, knew my father from Toronto. Uh, he told me that once in Orchaim, he once gave a talk about 
about Sodom. So he he mentioned that the he mentioned that the the closest thing to to Sodom is Las Vegas. Uh, I remember, and 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 he and he said that one that one of the one week uh, one of his students uh, there was a parents meeting and the parents didn't come and he asked the, the kid where where are your parents and he said my parents are in Sodom. Uh, it was very funny. So so the the why is Sodom? Sdom, which became the symbol, we, even in Glat Eichak, is Dom Ayinu. Right? We not in, we, we talk about Tisha B'av about Sdom is is it is a symbol of corruptness. Interestingly enough, Sdom is developed in the Jordan Valley. Why? And here is the key to today's shear. It is true that it is easier to live in Egypt by the Nile than it is to live in Israel with rain. Rain in Israel is a dangerous thing because there's no assurance that it will happen. You're taking a chance that there might be a drought, you won't have water. While Egypt, you are promised to have 24-7 water. That's what Lot wants too, but there's a catch. When you want to live in a place where you have no communication, no connection to Kadosh Baruch, to Kadosh Baruch Hu. If you have no um, connection to Kadosh Baruch Hu, that's where Sdom begins. Sdom, Sdom is a place where is a symbol of a city which is removed, disconnected from Kadosh Baruch Hu. In, in other, in other words, in other words. In other words, when Lot, when Lot says to Avram, I want to live in the Jordan Valley, it's not just that he's saying, I want to live in the Jordan Valley where it's comfortable. He's saying, I want to live without a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. In Eretz Yisrael, as we read in this week's parsha, as we say in Vayayim Shamoah, It'll only rain if we listen to God's commandments. So a person might say, why should I take that risk? Let me live in Egypt where I have water all the time. The answer is, and this is the answer, Moshe Rabbeinu is not selling materialism. He's selling spiritualism. He's selling Ruchaniyut. He's saying, listen, you want it easier? Stay in Egypt. It is easier in Egypt, but I am not selling you easier. I am not selling you a better life necessarily. There are good things about Israel, Erzavat Chalabu Dvash, etc. But you should know that what there is, I'm, I'm selling you a Ne Hashem Elokei Chaba, and that is the form of rain. So, therefore, going back to Lot, when Lot wishes to break off from Avram, Chazal teach us he's not just breaking off because he wants a better life. He wants a life that has no connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's where Sdom develops. But Eric, didn't Egypt also have famine in, in Joseph's time? Where? In, in Israel? Egypt. Egypt had a famine. Oh, time. yeah. Okay, you're right. You're right. Uh, famine could happen. You're right. I, I Famine can always happen. They're, they're always extreme. And yet, by the way, Egypt was the symbol even then as a country that had food. Right, maybe because of Yosef's dream, whatever. But Mitzrayim was better off. It was always better off um, than Israel. Okay, it's a good point, but it, but still, is it, is it, better off? So going back to what we're saying, Only right? Because of Joseph. Okay, but that could be. Okay, I agree with you, but that, but 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 uh, my proof is that even Avram and during Yitzchak's times, when there was famine in Israel, they went to Egypt. Right, Egypt was a source of plentiful, uh, uh, unlike Israel. But going back to what we're saying right now, Moshe Rabbeinu's speech in this week's parsha, talking about what Israel is special, A, it all depends upon what he's comparing it to. And therefore you have to know, is he comparing it to the desert or to Mitzrayim? And that's one thing that we spoke about that's very important. But the second point that we talked about, which I think is, is the more important point, is that when Moshe Rabbeinu compares Israel to the land of Egypt, Moshe Rabbeinu is not selling them um, a better, necessarily easier land, but rather telling them that this is the land of God where you are dependent upon Gosh Baruch Hu, 
So if you listen to the mitzvot, you will receive something that you can't get in Egypt. You will have a relationship with God. That is something that you will not have in Egypt. And when, I'm, when Moshe Rabbeinu is selling them the land of Israel, he's selling them the potential of having a relationship with the Ribbon Shel Olam. And that is in what's unique of the land of Israel, unlike Mitzrayim. You know, this idea, by the way, that being dependent upon Kosh Baruch Hu, um, is a, I think is a, is a very basic idea in our, in our religion. In fact, a few years ago, Rav Lichtenstein once had a conversation with Rav Sabato, the Rosh Shiva of Maladumim. And Rav Lichtenstein was asked, and it's printed in a book by Rav Sabato, he was asked if he thinks it's possible um, to create a relationship with God in a world where you don't feel dependent upon God. Rav Lichtenstein writes that in his lifetime, this has changed. He said when he was a little boy, he, he was born in the early 20th century, not the early, in the 20s, in the 30s. Of the, he was born in 1930-something. And he said when he was a child, life expectancy was so low. Um, you know, before, before uh, they had antibiotics, right, before penicillin, if you had an infection, um, you, you would die. If you were a family of 10 kids, the chances of all 10 making it, be, you know, to the age of 15 was very, very scarce. In today's world, we are growing up in a world where people really feel that if they don't feel well, it's really, going, you know, you just take a pill, you go to the doctor. There is, in, in the, tw the 20th century has, has changed something drastically in the world of religion from a, from a world that was, that always felt that if there is sorrows, in the world, you feel that Kosh Baruch Hu is your answer. In today's world, in a natural way, people don't feel that anymore. And Rav Lichtenstein, very interestingly in this article, really writes about the theological problem that exists in today's world of educating um, young people in today's world who do not feel naturally a dependency on Hakadosh Baruch Hu. It's, it's, very, it's a very interesting point, by the way, um, that I don't want to talk about too, too much, but, but this is going back to what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying. Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, I'm giving you, I'm selling you the land of Israel because it's a place where you'll be dependent upon Gush Baruch. I want to continue, though, this idea and talk something a little bit different. If until now we spoke about two models that Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking about, the model of the desert and the models of Egypt, I want to now, if until now we spoke more about pshat in the Tanakh, I would like to use the opportunity to talk a little bit more drush. And I want to say the following. I want to say that Moshe Rabbeinu's two models here are models that have existed throughout Jewish history. Throughout Jewish history, there have been cases in which we compared Israel to a midbar, and there have been times when we compared Israel to um, to Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim at the time um, was considered to be very technologically advanced, a land of uh, materialism, very very sophisticated in technology, doctors, engineers, and of course the midbar is a midbar, the desert. Throughout Jewish history, there have been situations in which Eretz Yisrael stood up against more, I would say, uh, in countries that had more um, plenty of food and, and culture and technology. And then the question really was, in what ways do I sell Israel? And then there are countries and times where when we have to sell Israel, we're selling it to people who came from the Midbar. Take the 20th century, right? We have models of North America, parts of Europe. And then in the 20th century, we had Jews from, South Af from, from Africa, from Ethiopia, um, and Jews from Russia, from the USSR, who came from a very difficult uh, regime I would say that the model of comparing Israel to the Midbar is really more Jews from Ethiopia, Jews from Russia, 
while the model of comparing Israel to Mitzrayim talks more to, um, to Jews, let's say from Western Europe, Jews coming from Australia, Jews coming from North America. So these, these, these speeches that Moshe Rabbein is giving us while he's comparing both uh, um, uh, the Eretz Israel to both models, it's a speech that has been going on for, for, for hundreds of years. And I, I want to share something with you that I really feel uh, is, a, is something very, uh, is, is a point that I, I even think that in my time, in my lifetime, has almost changed. Um, when people talked about Israel in the 60s and the 70s, the only thing that they talked about Israel, right, was about, um, you know, you come into a country where everyone's Jewish, everyone speaks Hebrew, we're all together. No one in the 60s or 70s tried to sell Israel um, that compare, again, compared to, let's say, Europe, North America, to Australia, that um, it's an easier way of life, right? That there is a, that you're making more money and you're having, a, you know, your house will be bigger. Um, and, and you always had to find in what way is Israel um, um, better than, uh, than a Midbar, but not better than Mitzrayim. And there you would have to really focus um, if you compare it to Mitzrayim, so you have to speak about the, re the religious uh, um, characteristics, the spiritual characteristics, the Zionist characteristics, the, you know, the, 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 the bitachon, the, the, uh, you know, Zionism, all that kind of stuff. However, in today's generation, I find something very interesting that more and more um, um, Israel is, is becoming a place where where to live in Israel sometimes is in the Western world today is considered uh, no less in many many ways than uh, other uh, countries in the world where people are you know have good jobs and making good salaries. I'm not comparing right now. That's not my topic right now. But I'm just saying to you that it's very interesting that in today's world sometimes um, people are actually uh, um, talking about Israel and um, when. Um, and, 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 and advertising and suggesting that actually Israel has real qualities, not just in the world of spiritualism, but also in the world of materialism, right? It's, it's, it's a good life. You can live in Israel today, and it's a good, comfortable life. It's not just a life of spiritualism, Zionism, et cetera, et cetera. So I just find that very interesting, um, that, that Moshe Rabbeinu's two models, even though it, it existed throughout Jewish history, I would suggest that perhaps in our days, in our world today, uh, you see that um, sometimes you can go back and forth with these models when one talks about the uniqueness today of Israel. Also, uh, um, using these two models today is something that's really, really uh, very true and different than it used to be. Tov, I um, I apologize. This is uh, the year I apologize for the, the balagan in the beginning of the shiur. I'm sorry, it took me a few minutes to get uh, sorted here. But I, uh, but uh, in Baruch Hashem, we were able to do it. Um, as I said, I'm in Camp Stone, in, in uh, not far, an hour and a half from Buffalo. Uh, so I'm not that far from you. So that's how I, I'm, I'm up. Usually, I'm, I live in Israel. I'm in Alon Shvut, and uh, it was wonderful to see everyone. Thank you for participating. And if anyone has any comments or questions, I'm here now. Thank you, and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.